welcome you to Emmanuel as we gather together to sing God's praises, to hear his word, to be fed with his meal, and to be inspired by all the kids from the Emmanuel Early Learning Center. We're so glad that you guys are here, and I'd like to, if you would, join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us together today. Fill us with your spirit, your spirit of joy, your spirit of hope, and your spirit of love. We give you thanks for all the people that are part of the school and of the congregation, and we pray that through our ministry we would reach others with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. They're kind of frightening a little bit, aren't they? 
And does anybody know what we call the lion a lot of times? Cat. Cat? Think of something else. King? King of the jungle. King of the jungle. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is a Lion in the Lion King movie. Probably why they named it the Lion King. It's awesome. <laughs> Disney was thinking there. So that's kind of what we think of when we think of this, 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 when we think of lions and stuff. And it's kind of scary, don't you think? But you get this, this idea. And the idea is that this is supposed to be kind of a representative of Jesus. That isn't how we think of Jesus normally, is it? <laughs> think of him as fierce, kingly, sometimes a little scary, maybe dangerous. But here's the thing. That's what the promise was that John heard. But then he turned around. Do you want to know what he saw when he turned around? <coughs> yeah. What? He saw, what's that? A lamb. A lamb. And what do you think of when you think of a lamb? Bad. Yeah. <laughs> Soft. Okay. Maybe not so scary. Furry. Furry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cuddly maybe. <laughs> Gentle. Would you be afraid to walk up to to a lamb? Yeah. Oh. Because it's nice. Because it's nice. That's right. Yeah, so I just want you to think about the fact that this lamb is also representative of, guess who? Jesus, that's right. So when we think of Jesus, we think of him in these different ways. We get these images in our head. We think, well, yeah, he's a king, you know, he's fierce and he's mighty, but he's also a lamb, which means he's approachable. We can come up to him. He's, he's kind and he's gentle and he sacrifices himself. So I want you to think of those, those kinds of images, especially once you get into, um, for some of you, when you get into your Sunday school room, you're going to be doing some stuff with lions and lambs, and, and hopefully you'll have some fun making some crafts and stuff. But let's go ahead and say a prayer. If you want to say it with me, we say, Dear God, Dear God we thank you, thank you for Jesus. Jesus. His, who is both the kingly lion and the gentle lamb. In his name, we pray. Amen. For it was while Jesus was with his disciples for his last meal, he took some bread and while they were eating, he said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then when supper was over, he took his cup and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so ever since then, we gather together as God's people, who eat bread, drink, drink some wine, and celebrate the presence of God among us. We pray that this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will strengthen you and preserve you and keep you always in true faith to life everlasting. Amen.
The good news this morning is from the last book in the Bible, St. John's Revelation, chapter 5. Then I saw on the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he could open the scroll and the seven seals. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb, standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God's saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them all to be the kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads of thousands and thousands, singing with full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might, and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them, all singing, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of God, the word of life. Well, I know you all are so excited to hear a sermon on Revelation. <laughs> uh, it's actually it's a very fitting book uh, to preach on right after Easter, as it's the post-resurrection. And I think we have a mic. There we go. Um, and because it's all about Christians who live in a world where the resurrection of Jesus is now a reality. Where God's kingdom on earth has come near in the person of Jesus Christ. But we still have to figure out how to live in that time between the reality of Jesus' resurrection and our own resurrection and his second coming. How do we still live in that in-between time as Jesus' people? In a world that is still overwhelmed by all of the worldly things like sin. I mean, let's face it. People are still people. Which means we still have abuse of power going on. We still have hate that tends to dominate in some sectors. We still have war across our world. These are all the realities that Revelation as well engages as you continue on through it. It's addressing a world that existed in John's day that was less than a hundred years after Jesus' resurrection when they were just a fledgling group of scattered communities throughout Asia Minor in the Near East, and also, it's for the world today, 2,000 years later. I think understanding Revelation for us, and understanding it's both from then, but for now, is extremely important, because how we understand Revelation and what we think about it winds up shaping 
a lot of our uh, worldview, how we view things globally, how we view things politically, how we view things in relationship to the earth itself, and how we relate to other people. So believe it or not, whether you're aware of it or not, some of the cultural understanding of Revelation can dictate how we live <coughs> our lives. It can alter the way in which we approach and the way in which we read even the rest of Scripture. So you may be wondering, well, that sounds crazy because how does this bizarre scene with lions and lambs and eyes and spirits and horns and heavenly choirs, how does any of that relate or shape my life? Well, first and foremost, this scene is one that really helps us understand not only how to read Revelation, but how to understand the way in which God fulfills His promises. Because as we heard in the reading, John is lamenting the fact, he's weeping, that there is no one worthy to open up this scroll that has God's in part judgments and in part promises. No one is worthy to open this up. And then finally, finally he hears there is one. There is one who is worthy. <laughs> the Lion of Judah. Well, this is good news. Because the Lion of Judah harkens back to the book of Genesis when Jacob's son, Judah, was blessed by Jacob and was called a young lion. So Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. This has been the promise throughout the entire world. Old Testament, that from the tribe of Judah, the Messiah will come. So this image of a lion says something about who it is that will be able to open this scroll. It will be the promised Messiah, the king, the fierce warrior that pounces on its prey. He was, of course, very dangerous. I'm sure most of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis and his Chronicles of Narnia allegory of Aslan, the lion, who represents Jesus. And if they ask him, they, they say, well, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver responds with, well, who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. So this is what John is expecting. This is the image, the characteristic of the Messiah that John is expecting. It's the promise he has gotten. It's the promise that has been throughout the entire Old Testament. The fearsome, roaring lion, a warrior like King David who fought like a lion and who conquered neighboring peoples to establish his kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. But then, he's heard the promise, he turns around, and what does he see? A lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. Now that's a very different image than a roaring lion. Because this portrayal of the slaughtered lamb as a conqueror completely upends and challenges our ordinary modes of thinking of conquering. Who thinks of a lamb as a conquering <coughs> royal figure? And yet, it's exactly what this is. Promised Messiah in the form of a slaughtered lamb is not a hapless victim, but is a figure of royal strength. As we're told, the lamb has seven horns. You're like, what on earth does that mean? Well, horns are emblems of power and dominion and glory and fierceness, as they were the chief means of attack and defense by the animals that actually had them. You think of a ram or Deer, it's got antlers, that's what they use to fight and they use to defend themselves. So it's also a symbol of royal 
and military power as well, because ram's horns were used as trumpets that were used to sound an impending battle or to sound the triumph of a battle won. So this lamb has these seven horns, the symbol of royal authority, filled with the seven spirits of, of God foretold by Isaiah. So while Christ's death may have seemed like it was a defeat, it is in reality a victory. For though through it he brings all people of all nations into the kingdom of God. Because that image of the Lamb changes how we approach Jesus. I mean, let's face it, no one would dare approach a lion. They're scary, they're, they're frightening, but a lamb is sweet and gentle and totally approachable. So the picture language John likes to use helps us understand the characteristics of Jesus. Yes, he is royal, he is kingly, but he is also gentle and sacrificial and approachable and not scary, not frightening. Because the Lamb makes a very fearsome, awesome God a way in which we are able to approach without fear. But more importantly, it also serves as a reminder to us that it is never a question of if God will fulfill his promises. How God fulfills his promises. Let's face it, most people have a pretty narrow vision of what they think the end of the world is going to look like. They think it's going to end in some spectacular fireball or some such thing. Yet God possibly has a bigger, grander vision for the future of our world. Because later in Revelation, we see this kind of hearing versus seeing, promise versus fulfillment imagery continuing to get played out. If you go on and you read chapter 7, I'm sure you've all heard of the 144,000 that are promised to be saved from the tribes of Israel. That's what, what is heard. That is the promise that is given, is that 144,000, the tribe of Jacob, tribes of Jacob, will be saved. Great. John turns around. What does he see? He sees a multitude of people that no one can count from every nation, tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. So when God fulfills his promises, the fulfillment is always bigger and it is always better, more inclusive and very different from what we expect and anticipate. I was reading recently that, you know, one of the great ways to succeed is to always under-promise and over-deliver. So that you don't disappoint. If you think about this, if God's promises that are already so amazing are his under-promising, imagine what his over-delivery would look like. And this is where the relevance comes in our own lives. Can we expect God to fulfill his promises to us? Absolutely. Now, do we know how exactly those promises are going to get fulfilled? Not always. <coughs> so we always have to approach when we read Scripture, we read Revelation, we hear the promises, but when we actually see and experience the fulfillment, it is going to be so much more above and beyond what was promised. He'll fulfill his promises, but it's going to go beyond and it's going to be something we don't expect. Because it winds up getting bigger and better. Which is why people, when they start to try to get too caught up in, well, what's, what's it going to be like? What's this going to be like? I don't typically try to give any kind of, of information on that because I sit there and I go, you know what? However it happens, it's going to be bigger and it is going to be better than anything. 
this puny little room in the mansion. I promise that. So this scene also reminds us that despite the kind of crazy bad imagery that we're, if you continue reading Revelation, that follows, the vision here is where it starts. This vision of a heavenly throne room, that's where God wants us to be. That's where God wants us to start. He wants us to be invited in to this worshiping community that sings a new song. And I know new songs are really hard to learn. We don't like to do it. I think just don't like new songs. <laughs> want the things we're, we're familiar with. But God says, sing a new song. And this is the God who creates all things new, who reaches into our lives, into our communities. He renews us, changes us, moves us forward in a world where, yeah, we live in the midst of some deep pain. We live in the midst of some deep struggle, deep divisions. God invites us into his divine scene, invites us to sing a song that transcends present pain and ugliness of our lives and our world and reaches into that divine future to give us a glimpse of what that is like. A world where we see more clearly God is in control. No matter what it may seem like down here, God is in control. When we get that glimpse where the act of worship itself penetrates into our dark, sinful, fallen world and transforms it for just those few moments into a world where God's vision is realized more fully. Because Revelation invites us to envision a different world. It invites us to envision God's world. God's vision for our future that isn't perhaps quite as bleak as we may make it out to be. Because it invites us to choose what is important in our lives and how we move forward in our lives here and now. Do we embrace worldly ways and understandings of wealth and power and oppressive systems that ultimately will devour and destroy? Do we allow worldly definitions of what is important and valuable to reign supreme in our lives? That is the question that all of Revelation asks throughout the whole book. What reigns supreme? Or do we see the world from a different perspective? Do we embrace a different way that is a bit more of a paradox? A way that seems absurd to the worldly powers that be, but ultimately winds up being true. After all, the, the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's foolishness to worldly ways, but to God it is true, and it is his vision. Where wealth is not measured in terms of bank accounts, homes, cars, but in relationship. Service, <coughs> sacrifice, rather than power and dominion and exploitation. So Revelation challenges us as a church in all these ways, especially now in the 21st century, where we see so many declining numbers in church membership and church attendance, especially mainline Christianity. You know, I always hear that, oh, the church is dying, the church is dying. But I was reading this week an article where the guy said, no, no, the church is not dying. The church is becoming a minority. The church is losing power and prestige and its place in all of the worldly ways in which it has become comfortable and has become custom and that we have enjoyed for such a very long time. Let me tell you, losing that power, losing that privilege is scary, and it is fearful. This is what we're used to. But is that loss necessarily a bad thing? Maybe scary, 
but is it bad? Not according to Revelation. Because when the worshiping community has been part of systems and things that are oppressive and focus on wealth and focus on all the things that are not part of what God's vision is, We've lost sight of what God's vision is anyway. So let us instead sing that new song that breaks in and transcends the world. Envision God's future that is bigger, that is better than we could possibly imagine. Join the churches of John's day who struggled. They struggled in their time. Struggled within their culture to hold fast to that vision of where God wants us to be while still in the midst of a confusing, sinful, painful world. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you so much for Jesus, the kingly lion, the sacrificial lamb, all wrapped up into one has come into our world, has come to let us get to know you, to approach you, and to know that your way is always bigger, is always better than what we can possibly imagine.
lift before you all of these. We pray that they and their families be given courage and strength and comfort when needed. With all the saints on heaven and on earth, we give praise to the one seated on the throne. To the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory.
face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor 